Welcome to the worship of God with the people of Augusta Road Baptist Church. Blessings to you on this day as we travel on the journey of the season of Lent, as we prepare to experience Holy Week and Easter Sunday. We invite you to join in this worship experience just as you are. Make space in your heart and in your mind. Embrace this time with your whole being. Consider how God might be inviting you into the season of preparation and fasting as you walk with Christ and with his followers. We are incredibly grateful for the opportunity to have you worship with us in this way. And this service, with its litanies, poems, and prayers, was produced by a source called A Sanctified Art. This liturgy, along with many of the other resources that will guide us throughout this season, was purchased by our congregation and is used with permission in this format. A Lent brings a divine invitation, an invitation into a deeper life of faith, an invitation to renewed spirituality, an invitation into deeper awareness of God and self. So we invite you to take this time and to carve out space right where you are for personal reflection and for prayer, knowing that the more open we are to God's presence, the more meaningful this season will be. As we begin our time together, let us lift our hearts in prayer. Almighty God who knows us, we are amazed by you. Your love never runs out. Your hope never runs dry. Your joy never gives up. We wish that we could be more like you in that way. In a world that knows scarcity, your abundance is shocking. In a world that knows fear, your joy is compelling. In a world that knows anxiety, your peace is captivating. We long for these things. So today we ask you, be with us in this life. Be with us when compassion fatigue rears its head. Be with us when stress makes it hard to breathe. Be with us when self-doubt pushes us in close. Be with us when exhaustion becomes constant or when loneliness becomes our primary language. Be with us and show us the way to the life you long for us. Show us a life of expansive faith. Show us a life of overflowing joy. Show us a life of absorbing beauty. Show us a life of engrossing purpose. Show us a life that is as honest and rich and meaningful as the one that Jesus led. And until that expansive and holy day, we continue to gather in prayer and praise. Until that day, we continue to look for you in our midst. So pour out a double portion of yourself onto us at this time so that we might catch a glimpse of your goodness. Oh God, we are amazed by you. Your love never runs out. So bring that never-ending love to us. For together we pray as you have taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Welcome to worship, and the peace of Christ be with you. In the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 through 17, it reads, God said to Noah and his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it. And remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, 
This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From Here in the Sand, a poem by Reverend Sarah Speed. You've been here before. I squeeze that truth like an orange in my hands, willing some form of comfort to run out. Roll down my wrists, calm these aching nerves. You've been here before, in the wilderness, in the desert, in the place where nothing is what it seems and everything is sharp. You've been here before. So surely you know how hard it is to hold tight to what is real in the middle of a storm. But because you've been here before, I will stand tall. I will sing songs of the river from here in the sand. I will sing songs of the river into the wind. A reading of the 25th Psalm, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for me be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenants and his decrees. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, we worship a God who doesn't keep score and doesn't hold grudges. We worship a God who invites us into a richer faith, a deeper love, a more compassionate existence with a million chances to try again. So let us speak truth into our lives, asking for God's help where we need it. Let us pray a prayer of confession together. Holy God, when we think that expansive life is about power, teach us a new way. Gracious creator, when we think that expansive life is about material wealth, teach us a new way. Gracious author, when we think that expansive love is about control, teach us a new way. Teach us to live as you live. Teach us to love as you love. Forgive us when we don't. Hear us as we silently lift our confessions and prayers to you. Lord, hear the prayers of our hearts that gratefully we pray. Amen. Siblings in Christ, no matter how many times we mess up, no matter how far we wander, no matter how lost we feel, God's grace is full to the brim. It overflows in desert places. It finds us where we are and it covers us in mercy. Hear the good news and believe. God's love is overflowing. We are drenched in mercy. Thanks be to God. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven came, saying, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. 
Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Join in reading our prayer for illumination. God of the wilderness places in our lives. It can be hard to hear you in the desert. It can be hard to hear you in the city. In the midst of our calendar reminders, rush hour traffic, and notification alerts, it can be hard to hear you. So we ask, make everything quiet. Pause the chaos, still the rushing, ease our racing thoughts. Give us ears to hear your word for us today, which promises that even in the desert you are full to the brim, and lend your ear to us as we silently offer our prayers and petitions to you. Lord, hear our prayers as we turn our attention to you. We are listening. We ache for your good news, and gratefully we pray. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith together. We believe God is love. We believe God's love is overflowing. We believe Jesus is like a river. We believe that river is running toward us. We believe the Holy Spirit is like a vessel We believe that vessel holds mercy for you and for me. We believe the wilderness is real. We believe the desert is lonely. We believe that Jesus has been there. We know that we do not walk alone. Even in the desert, we are loved. Even in the desert, God is with us. Even in the desert, this love overflows Thanks be to God. Amen. Different colors can mean different things in culture and in religion. If you go to the florist to pick out roses for someone, you had better understand the meaning of each color. Some are about love or falling in love and passion. Some are for sympathy. Some represent friendship and even admiration. Now, if you send the wrong color, you could give off the wrong impression. But given the right color, you can say everything without having to even utter a single word. Well, in the liturgical-minded churches like ours, the ministers will often wear robes with stoles of different colors, and each represents a particular season of the church year. We wear purple at Advent and Lent. At times, it stands for the royalty of Christ, while also recognizing the preparation that goes into each season. For Lent, there is a recognition of the penitent position with which we approach the journey to the cross. We may wear white during the seasons after Epiphany or on the Sundays of Transfiguration or All Saints or the Reign of Christ. We certainly wear it at Easter. We also wear it at weddings and sometimes at funerals to represent joy and glory in Christ's divinity and the reign of Christ in the world and the resulting promise of salvation and eternal life. We wear red on the days of Pentecost and on days of ordination. Now, these are days we recognize the movement of the Holy Spirit among us. And much of the year, we wear green, representing spiritual growth that comes from following the way of Christ. Different colors are associated with different meanings. While we may assign religious and cultural meaning to the different colors we experience in the world, at least when it comes to the book of Genesis, the entire rainbow is one of the first signs we get of God's love, God's grace and mercy, and God's connection and covenant with all of creation. You know, you could read the Bible as a great love story between the creator and the creation. It grants us insight into the nature of God, whose very essence is love, into a created world that is declared very good by its maker, into a humanity created in the image of the creator, but that is also endowed with a free will that causes it to move out of the connection with the one and loving made it, who made it. 
It gives us insight into a God who is relational, full of mercy and abounding in steadfast love, and who loves the creation so much, and who is so bound to humanity that God will go to unimaginable lengths to prevent humanity from succumbing to its own self-destruction. Like every love story, it is also full of drama. It is full of conflict and passion, separation and reconciliation. I mean, just six chapters into the story, the drama comes to a heightened point. God who created everything looks at the world, especially humanity created in God's own image, and God is heartbroken. The story says that the Lord saw the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now it goes on to say, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. But it says that God found a human who still seemed to have potential, a man named Noah. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for all the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. And God told Noah to build an ark, because the flood water was going to rise. God was so heartbroken, so ashamed at what humanity had become, so disappointed God's own sense of divine justice could not abide what humanity had become, that the story tells us that God decided to cancel the whole thing and start over again. Apparently, there are some things that God feels truly need to be canceled. The story speaks of corruption and wickedness, but it speaks of more than the things within us that seem to rot our spirits from the inside out. It speaks of the ways the worst of our inclinations result in violence toward each other. Maybe we can understand this today. What makes origin stories like this one so powerful is that they speak not only to some ancient reality, they speak to our reality today as well. We recognize the often corrupt and violent nature of our world. All we have to do is turn on the news or scroll through our social media accounts or feel the stress and tension and fear bubbling over as we interact with people every day. There are signs of violence everywhere. If the heart of the Bible's teachings, if the key to understanding the relational nature between God and humanity is the complete and holistic love of God, self, and neighbor, if the key to unlocking life to the full is in love that encompasses the heart, soul, mind, and strength, if the way of Christ is found in loving the world with the same love he put on display— then Genesis describes a tipping point moment early in the story in which everywhere you look, you see the exact opposite of those things. You find acts of violence and oppression, anger and hate tearing everything apart. And it comes in overt acts of violence and abuse against someone's physical form or a country, but there are also recognizable ways in which our violence towards each other attacks the heart, the spirit, and the soul in ways that are less obvious but their destructive capacity is no less profound. And there comes a moment in the story when God says, enough is enough, we need to restart. We need a do-over. But after the 40 days, after the rains have stopped, after the waters have subsided and the ground has dried, we get a glimpse into the true heart of God. Wickedness and corruption lead to violence, and violence leads to destruction. That is the story to that point. But God says that from this point on, the story will be different. So God makes a covenant with Noah, with his family, with all of humanity with them. Even more than that, God makes a covenant with all of creation. The creator will bind the divine self to the creation. The almighty God who is holy and set apart and whose divine justice cannot stand corruption and who has every right to destroy whatever God pleases will not employ the same means as humanity. Violence will not be the way of God. So as the ancients who first told the story understood it, God took God's own bow, God's weapon to send arrows of lightning down to the earth, and laid it down as a sign of peace, of grace, and of mercy 
and of love. And from that point forward, a rainbow was meant to be a reminder to us and to God that violence is not the pathway through which this story will be resolved. And the rest of the story ultimately shows God leading and intervening through love. Perhaps that's an important reminder on this first full week of Lent. As we journey to the cross with Jesus, we not only see the nature of God's sacrificial love, we not only see the lengths to which God will go to show us how much God loves us and that God's love leads to true, abundant, and everlasting life, but at the cross, we are also confronted by the nature of our violence, our attempts to destroy what is truly innocent and holy. And throughout the season, we are confronted with images and stories that remind us of the undeniable truth that we're flawed. We are imperfect. We get it wrong. We allow sin to corrupt us and twist us, cause us to relate to one another in ways that are unloving and violent and to take us away from God. But God says that isn't how this story will end. God's steadfast love and mercy are from of old, as the psalmist says, and it is to love, not violence, that God constantly returns to intervene and to rescue us from our own self-destruction because God's on our side and on the side of all creation. Thankfully, God never forgets God's promises, and God chooses to lead not with violence but with love. God allows love and the hope of the potential contained within humanity to overcome the forces that would lead to our corruption. Now, this becomes clear right from the start of Jesus' own ministry. The Gospel of Mark, which we read a moment ago, alludes to it. But Matthew and Luke go into greater detail. Each of the synoptic gospels records the fact that after his baptism, Jesus went into the wilderness for a time of fasting and preparation for ministry. It says it was 40 days, the same amount of time after which the entire season of Lent is patterned. And it was at his physically weakest moment, we are told, when he was hungry and thirsty and tired that he was tempted. He was given the opportunity to care for his own physical needs instead of staying the course and living into the preparatory nature of the wilderness time. He was tempted with power. And we know what they say about power. The power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But the way of God is not power, violence, and control. It is love, self-sacrifice, and liberation. He was tempted to be a spectacle and to seek fame. But the way of God is humility. Selfishness, the desire for power, and the desire for notoriety and fame, those are three of the most powerful corrupting forces in the world, and that so often lead us to violence and destruction. And the way of God's love in Jesus overcomes them. And as Jesus overcomes them, he has borne our burdens, forgiven our sins, called us to turn back to God, and given us new life. As I said this past Sunday, Jesus is able to pass the test because he knows who he is. He knows full well who God has called him to be because he has just heard the Spirit tell him. Just before this scene, Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, and it was during that event that the heavens were opened up and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, and Jesus heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, whom I love, and whom I am well pleased. That's the core of his identity, just as it is ours when we find faith in him. Again, Paul tells us that through faith we are able to be adopted as children of God, just as Jesus was. The truth of that identity is tested every day. And at least part of walking with Christ, especially in the Lenten journey to the cross, is about reminding us of who we are. And who we are is based first and foremost on the fact that we are created in the image of God who constantly chooses to show us the way of love with the hope that we will choose it too. What we see in Jesus' movement is what God tried to help us start with the story of Noah's family and the covenant after the flood, a chance at beloved community, a way of living into the reign and movement of God, a chance to have our minds blown and our entire beings transformed so that we can be fully wrapped up into what God is doing in the world the way we live into this covenant and beloved community is by living the way of Jesus, by letting go of the things that lead to corruption, violence, and destruction, and embracing the things that lead us to life. There was a meme that was going around this past Ash Wednesday and seemed to go around every year. 
It comes from words of Pope Francis, and it asks, do you want to fast this Lent? Fast from hurting words and say kind words. Fast from sadness and be filled with gratitude. Fast from anger and be filled with patience. Fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. Fast from worries and have trust in God. Fast from complaints and contemplate simplicity. Fast from pressures and be prayerful. Fast from bitterness and fill your hearts with joy. Fast from selfishness and be compassionate. Fast from grudges and be reconciled. Fast from words and be silent and listen. In other words, consider all of those things in your life that cause you to live something other than the covenant of God made with humanity and put them down and then embrace their opposite, something that will enable you to fully live into the love of God. We have a God whose covenant love for all of creation is constantly on display, who chooses the way of humility, sacrifice, and love as the method for overcoming our corruption, violence, and sin. We find it clearest, clearest in living the way of Christ. If we need a reminder, look to the rainbow, just like God does. Amen. As you leave this time, may you be awestruck by the beauty of this world. May you laugh and may it be contagious. May you overflow with love for those around you. May you be effusive with hope and quick to point out joy. And in all of your living and breathing and being, may you find yourself full to the brim with God's Holy Spirit. And may it change your life. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and the love itself, go in peace, full to the brim. Amen.